can say also I'm a PhD candidate um, at Florida International University. Laura Ogden is my advisor. And my research is generally about um, the politics of Everglades restoration, but tonight I'm actually talking about the Tamiami Trail. And I um, just wanted to um, talk tonight about what I think are these sort of four interesting periods in the history of the Tamiami Trail. But I also want to make this an interactive and more informal presentation. So if you have anything that you want to share throughout the course of the night, you know, please raise your hand. I'm sure many of you in this audience have anecdotes um, or tidbits of knowledge that you've gleaned about the Tamiami Trail. I have, a, I have the sense that you are all very well informed about um, the history of Southern Florida. So let's get started. So the Tamiami Trail, to me, is so fascinating because it's really a storied highway across the Everglades, but it's also a storied highway across history. Because it's really a great way for thinking about the larger sort of social and environmental history of Southern Florida and how Southern Florida really came to be in its current form. Um, as we'll get into, the Tamiami Trail was really central to the development of Southern Florida. So. Um, We'll take a journey today back in time, first to learn about how the Tamiami Trail is an engineering feat. And this is one of the things that most fascinates me about the Tamiami Trail. Uh, the second key idea that we're gonna talk about is how the Tamiami Trail is really a harbinger of broader social and environmental change in um, Southern Florida. The third idea is that I really see the Tamiami Trail as from about the 1940s on, this really important cultural fixture in um, South Florida swamp life, and that's a term that I have to give Laura Ogden credit for. Um, she has a book about that. So um, that's where I got that term, but we'll talk about you know, this really important cultural relevance of the Tamiami Trail to South Florida's bladesmen and outdoorsmen communities. And then in the contemporary moment, I think the Tamiami Trail is interesting because it's a portal to the Everglades, and it's also this iconic um, symbol of Everglades restoration. So we begin um, when South Florida was still a remote frontier region. This map is from about 1915, and it's a map of the Atlantic Coastline Railroad. So it really shows the, the dark lines on it are all the different railroads, um, the Atlantic Coastline and also the Florida East Coast um, that traverse the state. But what is most interesting about this map is if you look at the southern part of the state, there are very few rail lines. So it's, this is a very important map because it really shows the isolation of this region. This was a region that was really only accessible by sea in its early history and um, had no overland transportation routes. And so of course this idea of a cross Everglades highway um, really came into the minds of people when they started settling in Miami and Fort Myers because they wanted a way to really get across that landscape and open up that landscape for settlement, for resource extraction, to really turn the Florida swamp into something valuable. And so that is where James Jodan comes into the picture. So James Jodan was the Miami-Dade County, or Dade County, I should say, because it was called Dade County back then, tax collector. And he was an influential you know, businessman who lived in Miami, and he heard about this idea of a cross Everglades highway he was really excited by this idea. So he was like the Ernest Coe of the Tamiami Trail. He really propelled this idea into fruition of the Tamiami Trail. Um, he was convinced that it was possible. He led a surveying party across the Everglades shortly after 1915. They actually traversed the Everglades uh, mainly on foot, which was quite an endeavor. Um, and so he was really one of the key architects of the Tamiami Trail. And then, of course, the other character in our story, who one of you asked about tonight, Baron Collier, um, he was really central to the construction of the Tamiami Trail. He was the, basically the money bags later on um, in the 1920s, once Collier County was created. Um, Baron Collier really financed a large part of the completion of the Tamiami Trail over this really rough stretch of the Everglades, uh, just east of what is today current um, Everglades City. So. How do we get from this kind of Everglades to a highway across the Everglades? Well, it's pretty complicated, actually. Um, early builders didn't really know exactly what they were in for. Road engineers thought, hey, we can 
you know, we can draw a blueprint of a highway across the Everglades, we can survey the route, and it'll be pretty easy to accomplish. But they were wrong. Um, the Everglades proved to be a monumental natural obstacle to the construction of the Tamiami Trail. Um, and there were a number of factors that made the construction of the Tamiami Trail most difficult. Um, and one of those was water. Of course, this was at a time, so the Tamiami Trail construction began roughly around 19, let's say 1916, 1917. And at that time, the Everglades drainage had probably barely started and was very localized. And so you just had a lot of still very high water in the Everglades, which made the construction very, very difficult. Um, it made traversing the Everglades difficult, it made moving heavy equipment through the Everglades difficult because the soil was always soggy. Um, and then, of course, the climate of South Florida, it's hot, it's extremely buggy, so the construction crews also had a very hard time of it. And basically what they figured out that they had to do to build the Tamiami Trail was they had to, they decided to take a dredge across the Everglades, or several dredges, I should say, and basically sort of dredge out a canal and take the fill from that and build up a roadbed to the side. And this is initially what they tried, and they really tried that more on the west coast first, um, and they, you know, kind of built up this sand bed for the roadbed um, using a dredge. But that proved to be really difficult on the east coast because of the underlying um, shallow layer of limestone rock. So it, basically from Miami to what is today um, the Everglades City area, there is a thick layer of limestone that really underlies the soil. So once you start digging, you hit this really hard rock. And so it makes it very difficult to excavate. So what ended up happening is that they actually had to dynamite this rock. Um, and they realized that this was sort of a wrinkle in the process because um, they hadn't really done that before. So they had to figure out how to bring dynamite out in the Everglades and dynamite out this rock and then dig it out with the dredges. Um, so these dredges were really um, central to the construction of the Tamiami Trail. Um, these dredges were floating dredges. So they floated along the canal uh, that was that was dug along the side of the roadbed. Um, and they were also walking dredges in the sense that the construction crews you know, laid rails down um, ahead of where they were going to dredge and then they, the, the dredge would sort of walk along those rails. But what's really interesting is that you know, the Everglades was very sort of raw and wild at that point. So crews of men would go in front of the dredges and use machetes to really hack down the vegetation. And then they would pile this vegetation up and then they would lay rails on top of these piles of vegetation, you know, so they would kind of lay the vegetation over the muck in the hopes that the dredge wouldn't sink into the ground. But over time, because there was so much water in the Everglades, you know, this sort of pile of plant material would just become a pile of mud and the dredge would slowly sink into the ground. And men would often have to climb, you know, come off the, either the dredge or the drilling rig and um, wade in the muck up to their breastbone to fish out the rails um, and find them again so that the dredge could continue along its way. So this was by no stretch of the imagination easy work. It was probably miserable for the crews that spent time constructing the Tamiami Trail. What's really interesting to me is some of the construction methods. Um, the work crews actually lived aboard um, the dredges and the drilling rigs where they, which they used to blast out the limestone. Um, so, Actually, this is a better photo. So this is an example of one of these drilling rigs that they use to insert the dynamite into the ground and blow up the limestone underneath. And you can see at the, um, at the top of the rig, there were actually living quarters. So the men lived up there um, so that they could basically live out in the Everglades while they were constructing this, high, this highway. And this is an example of a floating living quarters and mess hall. So the work crews would literally you know, float along beside the highway as it was progressing across the Everglades. And um, initially, a lot of the supplies had to be floated in along the canal that they were constructing alongside the roadbed. And then if they were dynamiting ahead of the dredge, they would actually load the dynamite onto ox carts and they would use ox carts to take the dynamite to the crew that was dynamiting ahead of the dredge. So it was, it was this really like very complex effort to construct the road that required these sort of novel technologies, both dredging and 
these drill rigs for using dynamite. And actually during this time, so the Tamiami Trail, first, the construction first started in 1915 and it went through about 1928. Um, during that time period, Florida became the nation's third largest consumer of dynamite because they were dynamiting so much of the Everglades rock. So I think the dynamite manufacturers love the Tamiami Trail. So this picture um, is a really interesting picture because it just shows like how rough hewn the construction of the Tamiami Trail was. So you can see the roadbed to the side, which was basically just piled up limestone, um, and how difficult it was for early Model Ts um, to traverse the, this highway. So it was very, very much a rough highway across the Everglades. And this highway really ran into a lot of complications along the way. So there were basically three transportation districts that were formed to fund the Tamiami Trail, Miami-Dade County, a large part of Lee County, um, and then there was a separate district that was, well actually I think there were two, dis hmm. there was the Lee County District, which was like the Everglades City area, and then there was a coastal district from Fort Myers to Naples, and each of these had to contribute money. Well, of course, at that time period, really nobody lived in the Everglades, so it was really hard to tax people or issue a bond because you didn't have too many citizens to actually contribute to that. Um, so the um, Lee County in particular ran out of money fast, and by about 1922, the construction of the Tamiami Trail basically ground to a halt in Lee County for budgetary reasons and environmental reasons. It was just really hard to blast through the Everglades um, and build this highway. So um, there was sort of a period of stagnation, and to renew interest in the idea of the Tamiami Trail and hopefully convince the state to potentially give some money to the project, this group of um, Tamiami Trail explorers came together and decided that they were going to drive about seven Model Ts across the Everglades from the Naples area to Miami to renew interest in this project. And they were actually going to be driving it across this unfinished section, this about 30 mile unfinished section of the Tamiami Trail from near Carnstown all the way to the Dade County line essentially. So it was, it was like a rough stretch, and so they drove these cars across the Everglades. Not all the cars made it, because they got bogged down in the muck, um, but it was a newsworthy and noteworthy event, so these men really brought attention back to the Tamiami Trail. And it was around this time that Baron Collier really became extremely interested in buying land in Collier County, and I mean, in, excuse me, in Lee County, and formed his own county, Collier County, in 1923. And Baron Collier was a businessman. He was very interested in developing the Southern Everglades. He saw a lot of value in them. And so he decided that it was really worth his while to invest in completing the Tamiami Trail. And so he footed a lot of the bill for completing that section um, near Everglades City and really allowed that section to, to progress um, after it began to stagnate. And so finally, in 1928, um, after a lot of starts and stops, the Tamiami Trail came uh, to completion. And of course, there was a big celebration in um, Everglades City, which was then called the Town of Everglades. And uh, lots of fanfare, circus performers. This was a big deal, especially for people that lived in Everglades, the Town of Everglades, or what is today Everglades City, because they were, of course, a very remote, isolated town that only had access uh, to other places over the ocean until the Tamiami Trail was built. And then the Tamiami Trail really opened up the Southern Everglades so that they could move goods in and out and they themselves could move in and out over land. Sorry. Yes? Do you know what that building is? I have no idea. Um, it would, it is perhaps, is that, it's in the town building? of Everglades. Does anyone have it's an idea? It's the bank building. Right? It's the bank building. Does it, so it still exists today? today? Yeah. 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 No. Oh, it's a, uh, I think it's a bed and breakfast now. It's a bed and breakfast now. I think so. Mm -hmm. It was. Well, it was certainly the center for a lot of the fanfare for the completion of the Tamiami Trail. So after the celebration um, in the town of Everglades, there was also this beautiful archway that many people remember fondly that was constructed to uh, basically mark the Dade Collier County line and also probably commemorate Aaron Collier for his very generous contributions to the Tamiami Trail. But with the construction of the Tamiami Trail, the Southern Everglades 
was no longer an isolated place. So it really became a resource frontier. There was a lot of resource extraction and land speculation and real estate speculation that happened after the highway was completed because it, it then provided a way for people to access the lands that had before been very difficult to access in the southern Everglades. And as a result of that process, you know, some people benefited and some people didn't. So um, a lot of land barons, people who own large land holdings um, benefited, um, people who clam canneries benefited, timber harvesters benefited, um, and people, generally more people were going out into the Everglades, tourists and hunters. But the Tamiami Trail was actually a really difficult event for um, the Seminole um, peoples because it really changed um, their livelihoods and their life ways. And it was also a really important project because it was sort of part of this changing landscape where a lot of drainage and rec land reclamation was happening through road building an effort that would eventually culminate in the Central and Southern Florida Project in 1947. So the Tamiami Trail was really this sort of first step in reclaiming the Everglades as a wetland for human development and human settlement. And as I said, it was a really difficult um, moment for the Seminole peoples um, because coupled with drainage, it really changed their ability to harvest game and um, live off of the Everglades um, because the Everglades was really their homeland. But with the completion of the Tamiami Trail, their life ways began to change. They had to compete more with white hunters for the harvesting of game. There was also less game because of drainage. So they actually shifted their um, economy to a tourist economy and they built a lot of camps along the Tamiami Trail. Um, that were tourist attractions. So people would drive out from the east and west coast and model T's and sort of visit these Seminole camps and buy wares from the Seminole people. And so the Tamiami Trail really became an anchor point for their transition into the, um, the tourist trade, which was a way, which was a survival strategy for them because they were really a subsistence, um, a subsistence people and also people that depended on the, um, the pelt and hide trade which was coming to an end with drainage and other changes to the landscape. So this is a really interesting photo. Um, it's actually a camp, uh, a, a Seminole camp um, along the Tamiami Trail so it gives you an idea of what that looked like. And then this is a photo of uh, two Seminole women uh, preparing um, basically food um, so that either for themselves or for tourist consumption. You know, a lot of what they did was just perform their culture for it so then tourists would watch them, you know, to go about their daily rituals. And this was, of course, at that time, a form of entertainment for um, many tourists. So now um, that the Tamiami Trail is constructed, it really became this this central transportation corridor, but as motorists began to use it more, they realized how isolated and dangerous and scary it really was. And they realized that this long stretch of road needed what were called way stations. So people had a place to stop over, get gas, get help if they needed it. And so this series of way stations popped up, um, including what is today Monroe Station, um, to help motorists along the way. And with that, there were these uh, Florida Highway Patrolmen that would patrol the Tamiami Trail to really help motorists in need. And so this is one of those patrolmen. So that's, so there was this whole sort of cultural complex of trail life, Tamiami Trail life that sprung up along the Tamiami Trail that had to do with assisting motorists. And there was also, um, probably starting in the 1930s, but really taking off, I would say, in the 1950s, the Tamiami Trail became an anchor point for um, outdoorsmen and hunters who were really interested in exploring and hunting in the Everglades, both north and south of the Tamiami Trail. And so the Tamiami Trail provided a way for them to get out into the Everglades. And then there were these various sites along the Tamiami Trail, like Monroe Station, that were these staging areas where a lot of hunters would convene um, to, um, to eat, to pack their swamp buggies, to um, get ready for a journey out into the woods. And so Monroe Station really took on this role, especially from about the 1970s onward. And um, maybe many, maybe some of you knew uh, Dixie Webb, who was one of the proprietors of Monroe Station, who I understand was a very colorful character. Well, another thing, we used to have a sign there that said marriage is performed. <laughs> That's right, because you could have a shotgun wedding out of Monroe Station, from what I understand. Wild Hog Barbecue, of course. 
Uh-huh. And then it was always done earlier. That was always a big event. And that also spilled over into the Everglades Conservation and Sportsman's Club, too, right? Yeah. And that was another really important jumping off point for um, hunters and outdoorsmen when they went out into the Everglades. That was actually, I think, started in part by Cal Stone, who was one of the first sort of well-known woodsmen in the Everglades, um, who wrote the book Four Years in the Everglades. Um, so, as I was saying, you know, the, the Tamiami Trail really was the sort of key anchor point and access point gateway for outdoorsmen who um, used swamp buggies, who explored the Everglades on foot, who had uh, swamp camps out in um, the Cypress country north and south of the trail. Um, and it became really important to that community of people. And I would say that today the Tamiami Trail continues to be an Everglades portal, but I think it's more a portal it's still a portal for outdoorsmen and hunters in many ways. Um, there are still swamp buggy access points like Monroe Station. It just changed a bit in character. Um, and there is hunting that still takes place in the Big Cypress region. This is actually in the, um, the lower left-hand corner of the check station out at the um, end of Loop Road that hunters check into when they hunt in the Big Cypress today. But the Tamiami Trail today, I think, is also an Everglades portal for tourists, people who are really interested in seeing um, the iconic wetland that is the Everglades, our World Heritage Site. And so they go on airboat rides, they visit Shark Valley, which is you know, a really um, important part of Everglades National Park that's accessed by the trail. And then Clyde Butcher's Gallery, the Big Cypress Gallery, are just a few examples of that. Um, and then I also think the Tamiami Trail today is really important because it's the site of this iconic and controversial Everglades restoration project called um, Tamiami Trail Bridging which is really this 11 mile stretch of the Tamiami Trail that's just northeast of um, Everglades National Park. And it's a project that's designed to raise the roadway to deliver more water into the park um, because of course the Tamiami Trail acts as a barrier to water flow in many ways. And if constructed, um, will bring more water into the park. There's a one mile part um, of the bridging that's being constructed right now, but there are some sort of different ideas and opinions about whether more bridging should be constructed. And um, I'll leave it at that. But um, we can talk more about that if you guys are interested in that. But that's sort of my um, survey of Tamiami Trail past to present. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. environmentalists, 
um, like Friends of the Everglades, um, and hunters and outdoorsmen that used this landscape. And so when they got wind of the Jet Corps proposal, um, they formed a number of coalitions to oppose the project. And the Jet Corps, um, it actually went up to the highest levels of the Nixon administration, and Nixon actually quashed the project, but only because there was so much local opposition by these groups. And what I think is really um, amazing about the Jet Corps controversy is that it brought together um, environmentalists, people like Joe Browder or Audubon of Florida, with hunters and outdoorsmen. And they formed this really unique coalition to oppose this project that was going to basically destroy this landscape that they loved. So, you know, I think that was really a turning point that created a lot of what, you know, a lot of the envir environmental interest in protecting the Everglades from a variety of people. The thing is, it's still there and nobody knows what to do with it. It's true. I mean, there, there is still there are still training runways there, um, and I I don't know of any plans to phase it out. Um, they can never replace what was destroyed. It's true. There's a, a buggy trail there that goes through there called Horn Dance Trail. Uh huh. And uh, it, it was originally the route of the older Seminole Indian, mm -hmm. you know, a dugout canoe trail, mm -hmm. and they used to go to one of the islands up there and have their horn dance. And they destroyed, they built a beautiful deep water cypress mm -hmm. How do you ever replace that? No, it's unfortunate. I mean, at least they minimized the impact because if the jet port had been built, the, the specifications yeah, I mean, that were never got any further than that. Right. But I know what you're saying. I mean, that project did really change that part of the Big Cypress. Yes. Did you use that trail? Do you have a swamp buggy? Uh, I've never owned one personally because uh -huh. I have so many friends that have been okay. on the So, but I go out there, yeah. Uh -huh. And I've uh, hunted on gift with property. Okay. I used to have a squatter here in that area. Uh huh. I'll be in Florida. Rebecca, I wanted to, I've heard family stories about how the Seminoles were part of the construction of the western side. Uh, did you, in your research, did you? But into any suggestion that they actually were involved in the construction and laborers and, and that the, kind of thing? There's a couple references to that, not very detailed, but um, Charlton Tebow mentions it um, in one of his books that Seminole Peoples did actually work on constructing the Tamiami Trail. And then there was another um, archival document, and I can't remember, it's, a, it's an official document sort of written by proponents of the Tamiami Trail that um, summarizes the history and it talks about their involvement too. So they did actually work on the work crews, but I don't know too much more besides that. One of the stories that I've heard that, that, that uh, the women actually did the cutting of some of the debris that you described, palmettos and others, and they would be paid by the load uh, mm -hmm. once they arrived at the work site, mm -hmm. and they often supplied food as well. Mm -hmm. And they were, the Seminole peoples were invited to the um, opening ceremony at the town of Everglades. And it's, there's some really striking photos from that moment in time, you know, of these sort of influential white men, like shaking hands with Seminole leaders. And it's a really, these photos are interesting to me because obviously this roadway really changed the Seminole way of life. Um, and they were, you know, sort of in some ways shaking hands with the architects of this project that would really change their lives, and they worked on it too. Um, probably out of economic necessity would be my guess, but there was certainly some irony there, I think, for them. Well, you'd be delighted to know the refreshments tonight are Girl Scout cookies. No, I'm the season. <laughs> are you selling them? No, we're going to eat them. Oh, okay. And Bob was going, did we get something to drink, Robert? Yes, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we're going to thank you so much. Oh, thank you.